Hello, and welcome to session one of Ministry Care Training, led by Steve Atkinson, a marriage family therapist. My name is Mike Plew. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist myself and an adjunct instructor at Cal Baptist University. I've known Steve for over two decades. Steve is in his first marriage of 43 years. He has two adult children, five grandchildren. He has been practicing therapy, providing therapy to individuals, couples, and families for 38 years. Most of that's been in private practice, but he did um, practice in a psychiatric hospital and has provided uh, consultation for large organizations. He has two master's degrees in biblical studies and marriage and family counseling. He's trained 10 therapists, not just supervised, but actually trained 10 therapists. He's been involved in global missionary work. Um, I know that he spearheaded um, ongoing missionary trips to Mexico, and he's also gone to China, and he's been at Vantage Point for the last seven years. Steve is one of the few men I know that um, practices what he preaches. He is uh, the real deal. He's genuine. He's not going to ask you to do something that he hasn't already done himself or is willing to do himself. He's also one of the few people that I always regret not having something to write with when I'm talking to him because he's bound to say something profound. Uh, the training, input, and guidance you're going to receive from Steve is uh, invaluable. And so um, I wish you the best. Hi. I just want to say a few things before we actually get off the ground uh, with this uh, process. I appreciate uh, Val asking me to present to you some information for the next eight weeks. Uh, this is all new for me. I don't know if it's new tricks for old dogs, but um, I've been able to ask for the assistance of one of my very close friends, also a psychologist in this time. And so he's going to help me process this in the next eight weeks and put in these uh, presentations together. Uh, so I appreciate Mike uh, for doing that for me. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about helping people, and it isn't just about counseling necessarily. It's just anybody who needs help, and are we equipped to do that? Because in this world, uh, we're going to we're going to find trouble, and there's all sorts of it. The COVID thing has accentuated trouble. Uh, a lot of people had it already. The statistics are significant to the number of people that have increased in all sorts of things. Abuse of substances as well as relational abuse and so we know our church has had many calls uh, for those kinds of needs and um, I appreciate you being part of uh, becoming some answers to those to those questions so counseling is one kind of help people don't often seek counseling until they're forced to it's not uncommon for people to come for therapy uh, only to find out after weeks of counseling that um, there was also other issues. This can't work until this does. This is why professional therapists must do their own work, completing 3,000 hours of experience and be supervised for years before they are eligible for licensure. And we just want to make sure that you're going to feel equipped when you uh, sit in front of the people you care for. There's a critical piece of learning uh, how to engage someone. And counseling is more than just learning techniques. It isn't that you learn to listen, although that is true. But you also need to learn to engage more effectively. And so sometimes we hesitate maybe to ask a question or bring up or engage issues that we see are clearly in front of us. And so we know that effective counselors have done their own homework because they've learned to experience to confront things that have been bothersome to them and learn to feel through those things and face their fears. So you can't transmit uh, something that you don't have. And so um, I'm sure you would want to make sure, you know, that uh, if someone was taking you on a trip across the ocean that they'd learn to navigate that ship before you got on it. And so it's that fearful sometimes for the people that come to you, but it's also fearful for ourselves. The how of care ministry. So we have to find out what your story is. We're going to process that through um, 
tools that I'll be giving you uh, throughout this eight weeks. In fact, this uh, particular podcast is going to have you do a little inventory of some of how you function and how you process your spiritual life as well as your personal life. Do you know yourself? Now, it's my belief that God gave us marriage to teach me about myself. And so we walk into that relationship thinking that I was kind of the head of the game, you know, or I'm, I'm going to be a blessing to my mate, which hopefully would have been true. But I believe that God gave us our mate to reflect back to us who we are. And he also gives us relationships to do that as well. Are you free to be yourself with others? Do you hesitate? Do you express yourself freely? Are you in wonder of how people might think of you or what your opinions are? Either way, we want you to experience vulnerability so that you can know the people you see will feel being vulnerable in front of you. So if you're vulnerable and you're going to be vulnerable, they will sense that in your presence. So are you real? And a lot of times people get involved in a church because they learn how to fit in, because they have gifts and people appreciate their gifts. But is there an ability for you to be vulnerable to yourself with them and let them feel you're overwhelmed? And if you can feel these things about yourself, then the people you're with will get a sense with you that you don't have any expectations of them that aren't realistic as well. What did Jesus do when he was here? He didn't do a lecture series on systematic theology. He didn't preach to his disciples. What did he do when he caught a sinner? He engaged them. In fact, he was accused of being like them. The leadership of the time were caught off guard thinking that something was wrong with him as he has sinners, if you will, washing his feet and hanging out with those people. In fact, his own disciples were accused of not following tradition very well. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Is that the person you want to be known as as well? Do you want to have a reputation of those uh, of a person who goes out and seeks those who need care? Listen, you little wiseacre. I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm big, you're little. I'm right, you're wrong. And there's nothing you can do about it. So lecturing is not an intervention. And of course, if you're a parent, I tell parents that the lecture is for the parent. The parent feels better when they've told the child what they think and all their wisdom. Now, did the child learn anything? And does the child feel cared for and connected to after you're kind of done? So what's our plan for the next eight weeks? So each week um, you will watch a 30 minute video and that's what we're doing right this minute. And they should be within 30 minutes, give or take, maybe a few or maybe lesser or more moments uh, with that lecture. But at the end of that, you will have um, a homework assignment before we meet that week. And that assignment uh, will be uh, fulfilled and we will meet by Zoom for, it says one hour, I know Val says 30 minutes each. Um, I will have to talk about this because uh, I was trying to get a hold of her before today's presentation. But depending on how many people are in the room, we want participation. We want participation for each person and it's gonna be tough to feel uh, jammed for time to let everybody feel like their uh, process was uh, equally considered. So time, <laughs> for me, uh, and it's really just a personal motto kind of is uh, on time is late. And that's significant when you're talking to people, let's say for instance, we're gonna practice you being on time for these presentations when we get together as a group. But if you were 10 minutes late to someone's home that you committed to spending time with, Lots of times people pick up on your anxiety. It could have been your kid. It could have been uh, you try to do something before you got out the door, like my wife does on Sunday morning, thinking we can get one more thing done. But either way, people will pick up the anxiety you may feel and they will perceive that maybe being about them. Confidentiality, confidentiality. Um, I don't know that uh, we do this very well. If you'll note on the slide is this gossip or a prayer request. And um, 
Prayer gossip is a word that I've heard historically. When people tell you things, they are going to expect some things. We need to understand that this is privileged information. Privileged information. You didn't have a right to know this information. Someone chose to share this information with you. And if that's the case, they're going to need to feel that you are trustable with that information. So you are really no longer one of the parishioners. You are a friend. And really, you are more significant than a lot of friends because a lot of times friends talk <laughs> about friends. So therefore, you must practice strict confidentiality. When I was first in practice, I took seriously, it probably was an overkill mode to be perfectly uh, doing right what therapists were supposed to do. So I hear my wife on the phone talking to someone at work about someone else at work. And so I confronted her on that and asked her if the person she was talking about knew that she was being talked about. She instantly, of course, my approach probably didn't help for her to feel instantly defensive. But I suggested, all right, so if we called her on the phone right now, the person that you were talking about would be fine with what you were sharing. So we need to ask ourselves, if the person was standing there, would you choose to share that information? And so we need you to start with being in this class with people that share things with each other. And uh, when people call actually to uh, inquire of someone that I've even seen, I can't even share that they came to my office, let alone any information that uh, we might've talked about. Show, don't tell. Have the courage to be honest about you. You are the change agent. You need to lead with your weaknesses, which means you need to be as open about the struggles they may be expressing to you as they are with you about their struggle. Your struggles parenting, your struggles in your marriage, your struggles with your relationship to God. You need to take the risk of vulnerability. It's a risk. They're sharing a risk. Okay, so we need to talk about pain. Pain. What is pain? Emotional pain. It's a really tough thing to describe. It's tough to go to the doctor because they can't put it under a microscope, but uh, I just want to share this with you regarding physical pain. My name is Stephen Pete, and I was born unable to feel pain. My parents realized I couldn't feel pain when I was a toddler and chewed off half of my tongue. They then took me to a doctor, and the doctor ran a series of tests to confirm that I had this condition. What's your take on the idea? I think many times we've at moments of our significant pain thought, wow, it should have been nice not to be so vulnerable to the kind of pain I'm going through right now. But physical pain, as you see in this man's life, was significant because he couldn't feel pain. Therefore, he did something to his body, not even knowing. Emotional pain is a lot of things. Emotional pain may be only symptomatic. Emotional pain may come out because anger is being expressed. Emotional pain comes out because people are depressed. And so whatever it is, we need to learn to talk about our feelings. Most of the time, people follow the word feeling with an opinion. I feel you're a jerk. Well, that's not really a feeling. And maybe that applies more to men than women. But in either case, how to identify how we feel? Okay, so we're gonna talk about maturity. What does maturity mean? So we're gonna tell this story to kind of illustrate the opportunity to demonstrate some maturity. So after driving around the mall, you see that there's an empty space and you were going to drive and park there. However, just before you enter that space, another car recklessly cuts you off and takes the last parking space. <laughs> Not only that, but as he gets out of the car, he uh, shrugs his shoulders and is very smug about, you're a loser. So, how would you respond? Maturity lies somewhere between stimulus and response. For instance, at two years of age, when you feel like biting, you're probably going to bite. Unpleasant experience, child expresses himself, he's limited in his uh, ability to do that, so biting comes in handy, unless you're Mike Tyson uh, as an adult. <laughs> now, if you were 16 years old and felt like biting, we would hope that you have another response. My reaction to that stimulus gauges how mature I am to my responses to the stimulants that are in my life. So. How do you think you fare in your 
assessment of your own maturity. Few of us are grown up in all areas of our lives. This is kind of a training process to mature. Hopefully day one of your marriage looks a little different than day 20 and years later that you respond differently to your mate than you might have in the beginning. Now maturity, as you can see, this man flogging himself, it does not require you to beat yourself up. However, how able are you to admit when you're wrong? To say I was wrong. The word humility comes with the idea that you judge yourself equal to what people see. Did you or not do what you said? Did you or not yell? Did you or not show up late to the party? Humility's able to say, yes, I did. Now, let's be helpful to all of us because if you don't dread an admission, it's probably not honest. So I don't know if your admission is hesitating because of the person you're telling and maybe the person isn't worthy of that because they've given you an impression that for you to be honest with them uh, see, is uh, the cause of a lot of reaction of condemnation. But Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And they didn't respond. They remained silent. How well do you seek to ask forgiveness for something before you're even confronted with what you know you've done to another individual? We're going to talk about uh, emotional intelligence as it relates to maturity. So first of all, are you aware? Are you aware of yourself? Are you aware how you come across to people? So you have to have the ability to identify and name your emotions. How are you feeling? Are you sad? Are you hurt? Are you mad? And is it okay to say you're mad? That's not a non Christian response. That's an honest response. So how well do you harness your emotions and apply them to thinking and problem solving? What's in control of you? How well do you function when you're feeling? How much do your emotions control how you respond? So the ability to manage your emotions, knowing your limits and when you need help comes under regulation. The most significant dis functional uh, mental health diagnoses have with it emotional dysregulation measures. The person overreacts to a simple thing or underreacts to a big deal. So how well do you regulate your responses to situations? So if uh, in 1 Timothy 3, we have these um, identifiers, if you will, qualifiers of of a person wanting to be an elder. And these aren't really something that they do, although we can be hospitable, we can measure hospitality. I'm not sure temperate, yes, they maintain their sobriety, if you will, but really it's who the person is that they're identifying, not something that someone does. Anybody can look like those things. But are you one who does manage his household well? Do you show respect? Are you prudent? So we're gonna have homework. We're gonna have homework to measure some of these things that we've talked about today. And so in your uh, workbooks, we have uh, an emotional, spiritual health inventory. This is taken out of Peter Scazzaro's book, The Emotionally Healthy Church. And so I'm going to read a little bit, a paragraph at the beginning of uh, and it's and you have it as well. Um, the following diagnosis is a simple tool to help you determine your level of spiritual and emotional maturity. Take a few minutes to reflect on this simple inventory to get a sense of where you are as a disciple of Jesus, both as an individual and at church. It will help you to get a sense of what whether your discipleship has touched the emotional components of your life, and if so, how much. It will be a challenge. It will challenge you to consider whether you are an emotional infant, child, adolescent, or adult. Now, <laughs> that's a real tough thing. Again, if you're two years old and feel like biting, if you're 25 years old and you feel like biting, 
So there are two parts of this. There is A, part A, you can see it on the, the page to the right of what I just read. And that's uh, the more simple uh, questions about who we are. Number one is, I feel confident of my adoption as God's son or daughter and rarely, if ever, question his acceptance of me. And I would like to think most of us would put very true, number four. Um, in the second one, we're going to look beneath the surface. And so it asks question one, part B, it's easy for me to identify what I am feeling inside. Now, years ago, I went to a men's retreat and uh, it was put on by, I believe, Jeffrey Miller. He was came from Texas and he himself had developed a uh, spiritual inventory related to spiritual gifts and so, or the fruit of the spirit. And so he had 30 different measurements and he had four questions for each part he was measuring. And there was a one to five uh, option. In this case, there's one to four from not very sure to very sure or very true, not very true. And so he took that on himself. So there's 120 opportunities from one to five. Then he was asked to, and this was his inventory put on by groups in the church with each other in small groups. And they were to take it on themselves and then request that two other people take that same inventory. And so he picked his teenage daughter, can you imagine, and his administrative assistant in the church. Now, the rule was that if any answer of the 120 were two points varied from the response of, in this case, Jeff. So let's say he put a four in a response to one of his 120 questions. Well, there was one question that there was a variance of two on because they scored it a two. So he was confident of how good he was at this particular gift and the two measurers didn't think so. Now, not only did he have to come to terms with that, but he had to share that with, the, with his small group. And you can imagine a, a pastor of the church having to confess these things. And so before he did, he was asking for another song to be sung and a prayer to be prayed. <laughs> And he finally shares the question that he overrated himself. And the question was, does he brag? Do you brag? Now, of course, we would consider that gift uh, against pride or humility. And as he shared that with the group, they all busted up laughing. Now, of course, you ask the question, why did they bust up laughing? Well, of course, they busted up laughing because they already knew that is what he does. <laughs> And so what's neat about this group that uh, he was involved in that they actually came up with homework for him to do, a book maybe to read, some passages of scripture, you know, to look up and memorize. But that's the point is, how honest can you be with yourself about yourself? And so you are gonna take this test and you're gonna score it. And then there is a chart that you put your score on and then it rates that category or that section there are seven of them in part B, one in part A. How well you do based on that category, given to be infant, child, adolescent, or adult. The second uh, homework that you have in your packet is a personality inventory. And you are gonna go to humanmetrics.com and you are gonna take the test at 64 questions, yes or no. Now it's possible as I'm giving this to you that maybe you've already done that because I was gonna to talk to Valerie about maybe giving you this inventory, personality inventory when we do your interview. So in either case, if you can take it this week and as soon as possible, my email is uh, attached to that page. And as soon as you can, because I'll be giving you a 20 page handout and I'll get it to you if we weren't able to do it before. And we will be discussing that uh, as well this week uh, or maybe the next uh, in our uh, group time. So I appreciate the time that we're going to be able to spend together. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, I want you to feel free to call myself, Valerie, or any of the people that are involved in uh, the leadership of this process. Thank you for doing this with me. Bye-bye.